All right, so in the previous video, we saw an example where we confirmed that at least in that example, um, the two sides of Green's theorem both evaluate to the same number, which gives us some confidence that we've got the right result here. Um, how do we see that this actually works? Um, so this will be, well, okay, it will be very much a sketch of a proof, right? But it'll give you some idea of why this is true. Um, there are, depending on how rigorous you want to be and how careful you want to be about, you know, um, the conditions under which Green's theorem is valid, you might want to try to figure out sort of the, the most general set of conditions, you know, uh, under which Green's theorem holds, we're, we're imposing fairly strict conditions, but f from the point of view of calculus, they're not that strict because they're, they're conditions that are satisfied for almost all the examples we look at, so it's, it's not a big deal. Um, but if you're going to do this in, in you know, like a more advanced calculus course or an analysis course, um, you might want to kind of be a bit more careful. So one of the ways you can think about doing it is we just saw that it works for a triangle, right? Um, so here's, here's, one way, here's one way that you could do it, all right? I'm going to show you a different approach, but um, so one way you can do it is, is you prove it. You prove that it's true for a triangle, for a triangle, okay? Um, okay. Once you prove that you can do it for one triangle, um, you prove it for sort of a, um, I don't know, I want to say like a union of triangles. Uh, really what you do is you prove it for, um, so the technical term here is you would prove it for what's called a, a triangulation. Right. So you might have have some kind of, you know, region, some larger region that you want to integrate over, right? And, and you just start carving it up into triangles, right? So you might say, well, actually that's not so bad, right? So you cut it up into triangles and you go from there, right? Um, may, and maybe you only prove for certain types of triangles and you have to be a little bit more careful about the types of triangles that you do, right? But, but you do it like that. And, and then the way, the way this would work is that if you start thinking about orientations, right, um, for region one, you go around like that. That's your positively oriented curve there. And then you move on to, to region two. And you say, what's the positively oriented boundary for region two? Well, you'd go around like this, like this, like this. And you notice that those two are now opposite orientations, right? And, and then for region three, you do the same thing. You say, what about region three? I go like this, like this, and like this, right? And, you'll, and you notice that, and this is something that's kind of true generally, that any of these kind of interior cuts that you make to divide your region up into triangles, um, they always cancel out when you consider this thing as a whole. And then you'll notice that if you take just the outer boundaries, you get, you get the positively oriented boundary of the original region, right? Um, so, so you can, you can, union of triangles, you can kind of work out generally that this makes sense, right? Um, and, then, and then the last step might be that, okay, uh, that works if you, if you have some kind of polygonal region like this, but what, what if you're trying to do it for some kind of like, you know, you got some kind of blob that you want to do, right? Um, and so then the idea is, well, okay, um, your blob can't be done exactly as a region of, of triangles, but you can, you can approximate the blob, right? You can, you can find some polygonal approximation for the blob, right? Something like that, and then you triangulate triangulate that approximation and you, you can go through these details. Um, so there, there's like a very general approach like that um, if you're worried about kind of the fine details, but we're, we're not so worried about the fine details, right? So, so what you do is, is you say, okay, well, let's just consider, consider a region D where you have two descriptions, 
So let's say you, it's, it's one of these ones where you can give it by both saying that x is between a and b, and y is between, let's say, f1 of x and f2 of x. But on the other hand, you could think of it as, well, y is between, let's say, c and d, and, and x goes between, say, g1 of, of y and g2 of y, right? And we've seen enough examples where we know that generally um, probably one of these, one of these two and one of these two, they're one of them is probably a constant. Uh, and then the other one is probably, you know, this function would be the inverse of that function, let's say, right? Um, but let's just kind of focus on, on this one here, right? And suppose you have this kind of region given like that. So here's, here's you know, F2. Here's your... Now this, uh, you know, I'm, this is not the kind of region exactly because when you have these two sides like that, it's not, this is not one that's easy to write like that, but it's a little bit easier to see what's going on if we draw the region like this, okay, and then you can realize that it's going to work more generally. Um, so if you thought about doing, so let's say this is just some region D, right, and you think about doing the double integral. So you're doing the integral over d of, well, I'm not going to do both halves. I'm just going to do dp dx. Um, all right, and you know what? Let's even put that minus sign in for good measure. Okay. And so the reason I'm choosing just this half is, is that, well, um, oh, sorry, it's dp dy, dp dy, yeah, which is what we want, right? Because there are two reasons to integrate first with respect to y. One is that integrating with respect to y will cancel out the derivative with respect to y, give you back p. The other is, of course, that the re we've described the region in a way where it's natural to integrate first with respect to y. So we'd say, okay, so x goes from a to b. Uh, y goes from f1 to f2, okay, um, minus dp dy, dy dx. And so what you're going to get is you're going to get p at, um, so we're going to plug in these for y, right? And with the minus sign there, we do the, the lower limit first. So it's going to be p at x, f1 of x, minus p at x, f2 of x, integrate with respect to x, right? Um, on the other hand, if you, if you think about doing the integral around c of just, just the p, p dx part, Okay, don't worry about the QDY. Um, then you say, okay, well, first of all, let's think of it like, so that the overall boundary would be like that, right? So let's call that C1. And C2, this is going to be minus C2, because the natural way to orient this curve would be going this way, right? We'd want um, C1 we would take r, r of x to be x f1 of x with x between a and b and c2. The natural thing to do would be to take r of x equals x f2 of x with x going from, from a to b, right? Um, but with this, with this parameterization for the top, you'd be going left to right, not right to left as you need, right? So you'd be doing the integral over C1 minus C2, P dx, right? So that's the integral over C1 minus the integral over C2. And you might be wondering, hey, what about the other sides, right? What about this side? What about that side? Why didn't I include those? Well, 
any, any part of your boundary that is a vertical line is one where x is held constant, so it's one where dx is zero. So those don't contribute to the integral, okay? But then you parameterize these and you say, okay, well, uh, the integral along C1 is the integral from A to B of P of, so we put in X is just X, Y is F1 of X, DX is DX, and along C2, we set Y equal to F2 of X, right? And then we realize that that's exactly that's exactly what we have here, right? So these, these are the same. And if you were to do the other half, if you did the, the dq dx half, right? Well, then that's when you want to use this description of your region, integrate first with respect to x, right? So the integrating with respect to x cancels out the d dx. You get q evaluating at the, the two sides. You go through the details and you, you get the same thing. And then you put the two halves together as a whole, and you get Green's theorem, right? So the catch is, the catch is that you, you need to be able to describe your region simultaneously with both of these descriptions, right? Because you're gonna need to use one description for the PDX part, you're gonna need to use the other description for the QDY part, right? And so then you worry about, okay, yeah, there's lots of regions that can't be described in, in both ways. Sometimes it's only one way. Um, but we also, we know what to do, right? If, if your region can't be described in, in both ways, you can carve it up. The same way we did this kind of tri triangulation here. Um, if you have a region which cannot be described in, in both ways, a sort of type three region, um, you can take your region and you can cut it up into pieces where each piece is of the right type. And then you apply Green's theorem, you put it all back together, and you find that the places where you cut, they all cancel out um, just like they did in this example, okay?